Okay, so I am not a woman, but I'm told they exist, so we should talk about them. And before we even think about talking about them, we have to define what they are. Obviously. So what is the definition of a woman? Personally, I don't give a f I know what a woman is. A woman is what your dad said he felt like when I was railing him last night. But we're at a point now where we have to define what a woman is. And that's because of a guy called Matt Walsh. Matt Walsh, seen here looking like a reanimated 1970s geography teacher, is a conservative pundit known for his controversial mind, who made a feature-length documentary about his journey to discover the truth, wherein he asks some zany progressive types to answer the question, what is a woman? One of the big exposés of this documentary is that quite a lot of progressive people, even professors of gender studies, can't give a good definition of a woman. What exactly is a woman? Well, it's it, for me, it's it's actually a really simple answer, and that's a person who identifies as a woman. But what are they identifying as? Uh, as a woman. I but but what is that? As a woman. Do you know what a circular definition is? I do. It's sort of like what you're doing right now, where a woman is is a woman. Now you know what, Matt. On this point, I agree. Anyone who identifies as a woman is not a good definition. A circular definition is not a definition at all. The whole point of a definition is to give you a better understanding of a word, and this just doesn't do that. In fact, this statement is just as useless as a definition as this one. But coming back for a second, why is Matt Walsh doing this? Is the center of this man's political message really the fact that some people struggle to define the word woman? Or is this more like his Martin Bailey where you get your foot in the door with a fairly defensible statement and then follow up with your real beliefs which are maybe a bit less savory? Maybe that's why he made a documentary about how some progressive people might look silly when they try to define what a woman is and not what he really believes which is gender transition should be illegal for anyone of any age. But let's not make this about Matt Walsh. I don't care what's going on behind the dead eyes of this freedom-hating f***. If you agree with this, then there's probably nothing I can say that's going to change your mind, and I would also just recommend you have a look at Saudi Arabia or some bullshit. However, if you are here because you just want to hear a good progressive answer to the question, what is a woman, then maybe I can help. And I'm sure you're wondering, isn't this video a bit long for such a simple question? A woman is an adult female person. Done. Get f***ed, etc. And then you might think this definition stands at odds with the progressive line which says trans woman or woman. Or maybe you just agree with this dictionary definition but not this one. Who knows. What I'm gonna do, hopefully, is show you how both of these statements can be correct at the same time. And if that sounds interesting, you should stick around. Hey, 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 don't mind me while I thank today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. Are you telling me you don't already have Atlas VPN? Why not? What's wrong with you? Do you not even know? A VPN moves your internet activity through an encrypted tunnel, which means you can mask your identity online. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things. It means you're protected from spying. It means you can access geo-locked content on platforms like Netflix, Amazon Prime, and Disney+. And I'll tell you something else. Did you know that by switching countries on your VPN, you can save money on multiple worldwide services? Did you know that airline companies will often change their prices based on what country you're browsing from? Can you believe that? F*** those guys. Don't let them do that to you. Get Atlas VPN today by clicking the link in the description. Do it now, you fool. You rocket snapper. At the moment, they're offering a deal of 83% off for three years. That means you'll only be paying $1.83 a month and you'll also get three months completely free. And there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. Can you imagine that? Well, you don't need to. Just click the link in the description now before it's too late. What are you waiting for, mate? Thanks again, Atlas VPN. Part 1. Definitions The narrative presented here by Matt Walsh is quite simple. 
Woman is a simple, age-old concept, but these dastardly progressives are out here twisting themselves up into pretzels, trying to find a definition that doesn't exclude their trans allies, and that's funny. Classic conservative W. When Matt Walsh asks what is a woman and people can't give him a succinct answer, it gives the impression that conservatives are confused about what should be a really simple term. But I would argue it isn't so much these people who are confused about women, it's Matt Walsh who is confused about language. Look at this picture. That is your humble narrator, toddler box, at the age of three. By then, I already knew that this picture was taken with a camera. I was able to tell what a camera was, and I was mostly able to tell cameras apart from things that were not cameras. But how? Did I know the definition of a camera? Do you know the definition of a camera? When you identify a camera, are you consciously checking whether or not it's in fact a device that consists of a lightproof chamber with an aperture fitted with a lens and a shutter through which the image of an object is projected onto a surface for recording as in a photosensitive film or an electronic sensor or for translation into electrical impulses as for television broadcast? No. If you were to think about all the words you know, how many of them did you really learn by consulting a dictionary? Probably not many. If a child asked you, what is blue, would you really say a color whose hue is that of a clear sky or that of the portion of the color spectrum lying between green and violet? Or would you not just point at something blue? What you definitely could not do is come up with a definition that includes all things blue and excludes all things that are not blue. No universal definition will tell you where blue ends on this spectrum and something that is not blue begins. The point is, definitions do not always provide us with strict rules or boundaries. They very rarely do. When you try to act as if they do, you can end up looking like a bit of a walloper. And no one can demonstrate this issue better than the former television writer Graham Linehan. In one of his many Twitter exchanges with trans rights advocates, Graham was asked to define chair in a way that includes all things which are chairs and excludes all things which are not. To which he responded, Heh! <laughs> a separate seat for one person, typically with a back and four legs. Happy to help, but try Google next time. The definition of woman is there too. Heh! <laughs> now, I'll give you a second to answer this question. Does that definition include all the chairs and exclude all the non-chairs? Well... <laughs> and there is the pinnacle of anti-trans logic. Graham Linehan sitting on a horse's face and calling it a chair. This definition absolutely does not exclude everything that isn't a chair, not even close. But all the same, we still know a horse is not a chair. But how? Is there anything in this definition that helps us understand how this is more of a chair than this? The mistake I think Graham has made here is that he's fallen for what Wittgenstein would have called the philosopher's craving for generality. Oh yes, this is happening. You asked me what a woman is, and now we're talking about Wittgenstein. In philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein rejected the idea that definitions have to be based on a set of necessary conditions. Instead, he argues that we understand words based on what he called a family resemblance where words are understood as a complex network of similarities overlapping and crisscrossing. The example he gives is the idea of a game. We all know what a game is, but I'm guessing most of you did not get that understanding from this absolute weapon of a definition from Merriam-Webster. Game is actually really hard to define, but all the same, it's still something most of us understand from a very young age, and the way we learn that is through examples and family resemblance. If you'll excuse the slightly lengthy quote, consider for example the proceedings that we call games. I mean board games, card games, ball games, Olympic games, and so on. What is common to them all? Don't say there must be something common or they would not be called games, but look and see whether there is anything common to all. For if you look at them, you will not see something that is common to all, but similarities, relationships, and a whole series of them at that. To repeat, don't think, but look. Look, for example, at board games with their multifarious relationships. Now pass to card games. Here you find many correspondences with the first group, but many common features drop out and others appear. When we pass next to ball games, much that is common is retained, but much is lost. 
Are they all amusing? Compare chess with knots and crosses. Or is there always winning and losing or competition between players? Think of patience. In ball games, there is winning and losing, but when a child throws his ball at the wall and catches it again, this feature has disappeared. Look at the parts played by skill and luck, and at the difference between skill in chess and skill in tennis. Think now of games like Ring a Ring of Roses. Here is the element of amusement, but how many other characteristic features have disappeared? And we can go through the many, many other groups of games in the same way. Can see how similarities crop up and disappear. And the result of this examination is, we see a complicated network of similarities overlapping and crisscrossing. Sometimes overall similarities, sometimes similarities of detail. I can think of no better expression to characterize these similarities than family resemblances, for the various resemblances between members of a family, build, features, color of eyes, gait, temperament, etc., etc., overlap and crisscross in the same way. And I shall say, games form a family. When it comes to defining a woman, we can always ask the question back. If a woman is an adult human female, then what is an adult human female? Is there some essential feature that separates adult human females from all the non-adult human females? Well, if we're going by the most rigid definition of sex, the essential feature of a female would be her capacity to make bebe. And that's simple, isn't it? In nature, the females release the eggs and the males produce the sperm. So sorry to all you non-binary transgender f**ks, but there is no middle ground here. There is no speg or... <laughs> Spurg. <laughs> I'm sorry. But unless you're willing to say that someone with a barren womb or someone who's gone through menopause is not a woman or less of a woman, then you have a problem. Because there are plenty of people in the world who we would all consider female despite them having never once released an egg. This is the same problem you run into with any other trait. Even if we assume away all the trans people, you don't need a vagina to be a woman, you don't need ovaries to be a woman, and you don't need XX chromosomes to be a woman. However, some of you might say, come on, loner box. Can't we just say women typically have these traits? Assigning women to someone who is missing one or two of these traits is one thing, but trans women have none of them. Which is true. Family resemblance may show how the boundaries of a word can be blurry, but it doesn't eliminate them completely. If we want to include trans people under that definition, you would still need to show how they fall under that family resemblance. To do that, some people might start with part two, ultimate postmodern gigasoy. I don't actually hold this position, but it is very popular, so we should bring it up. So the argument here is that we only ever create categories insofar as they serve some kind of social need. We might say the definition of a woman is adult human female, but whether or not we include trans people in that definition is really up to us. In the same way that things don't need four legs and a back to be a chair, trans women don't need all the biological components of adult human female to be women. Here, they would talk about how the concept of a woman is more than just a collection of biological traits. It's also a set of social roles, appearances, and customs. And because we don't typically identify women by looking for these things, trans women who change their presentation and social signifiers, for example, their name and pronouns, are best seen pragmatically as women. By adopting the social role of women, they're moving themselves into that sphere of family resemblance. And in a way, it kind of works. This is why conservative pundits will sometimes do that thing where they instinctively use a trans person's preferred pronouns and then immediately have to correct themselves. The, the transgender woman from uh, Orange is the New Black. I never watched that show. I've never watched that show either, but she's on the cover of Time Magazine. Oh. Or he's on the cover of Time Magazine. You know Taft Tadgens? Yeah, well, was, she was... He! She? she? Well, yeah, go ahead. Whatever. You, I mean, like, that you, you literally pronoun her correctly the well, first time. Like, she's a she in your head. That person looks like a girl. Exactly. It's like, and that's I'll, enough I'll, for I'll, you. I'll give you this. Like, my audience gives me so much shit when I say, like, Caitlyn Jenner. And it's like... Well, I can't, like, I almost can't even help it, you know what I mean? Exactly, that's the point. Now, I can't see inside these people's heads, but my guess is they do this because it isn't actually normal to categorize people in the way they say you should. 
Their instinct is to see the people they're referring to as women because of family resemblance, and they have to fight that instinct whenever they want to misgender someone. Which is kind of funny. Coming back to Wittgenstein, the argument is that we don't need to define women by naming any single common feature or necessary conditions. Instead, what we do is appeal to normal practice. A very good example of this actually comes from a rather crude exchange on 4chan where a biological essentialist argues, if it has a penis, it isn't a she. To which Johnny Bravo, the social constructionist and Wittgenstein understander replies, I'm straight. So whatever makes my dick hard is a woman. Obviously, this is just a joke. Don't don't use this argument in trans conversations. So if women is socially constructed, the social utility of including trans women in that category would be fewer trans people will commit suicide, the mental health issues of trans people are dramatically alleviated, and straight men will no longer have to spend their evenings nervously googling whether or not their boner for Blair White makes them gay. Everyone wins. But then a more old school or modernist type would say, no, we don't just invent categories for social utility. We use categories to refer to things that are facts of the universe, even if those facts make us unhappy. And if you stick your head under water for long enough, no amount of social construction is ever going to save you from the concept of drowning. I think there's a problem here where people will confuse the idea of a social construct with a social invention. For example, when people write essays where they describe something like the body as a social construct, they're not saying bodies are made up. The body is real. The social construct only refers to the way we understand it. If we go down the line of treating gender purely as a social invention that only exists because we agree it does, I would argue that that can take you into some kind of difficult places. For example, if everyone in society decided tomorrow that trans people don't exist, would they just stop existing? If your answer to that is no, then you are accepting that there is something internally real about trans people. Whatever that something is, it wasn't socially constructed into existence, nor can it be socially constructed away. And whatever it is that makes people trans, it's no less real than oxygen, water, or your mum. And if you reject that notion, you do run the risk of running into what I would call part three, the turf trap. So some people who are pro-trans will argue that sex and gender are completely separate. Sex refers to observable biological truths and gender is all of the social roles and expectations that are placed on males and females. In that case, a woman's sex would be XX chromosomes, ovaries, vaginas, and their gender would be uh, uh, oh, uh oh. Good luck filling that one in without stereotyping women. And the problem with this aside from the one I've just mentioned, is that this is basically a TERF argument. I've noticed recently that TERFs will use this very sneaky tactic where they try to adopt the language of gender abolitionists. They'll say, all gender roles are oppressive. They're costumes that are forced upon us through thousands of years of objectification, patriarchy, capitalism, and all that. But bubbling just below the surface of that progressive sounding rhetoric is the message You are the sex you were born as, bitch! And no amount of makeup and dresses and pronouns will ever change that. The other problem with the sex and gender are completely separate line is that it does suggest being trans is nothing more than a social phenomenon. If sex is strictly biological and gender is strictly social, then transgender identities would have no factual basis to them. And if your gender identity is nothing more than a social invention, that would suggest that transness is something that could be socialized into someone. Or worse, socialized out of them. And based on our current understanding of trans people, that definitely doesn't seem to be the case. That's why conversion therapy doesn't work. Not on trans people, and not on cis people. The question it might help to be able to answer is, why are some people trans? Clearly it's something in their psychology, and this is where I think progressives should be a lot more willing to challenge anti-trans types on their own ground. Because according to an increasing number of biologists, the answer to where being trans comes from might just be in the brain. I emphasize the word might because the brain is the most complex organism in the known universe and our knowledge is very limited, but there is a growing consensus among biologists that we do have something called brain sex. 
Now, I can confirm that brain sex is real, but I don't want to go into that here because I don't want to embarrass your mom. <laughs> now, the evidence for trans and cis people having different brains is not simple. Without getting too bogged down, I'll just give you a rapid fire. Trans and cis women have similar levels of activity in the right superior frontal gyrus, the part that helps people distinguish voices. Trans men and women seem to have their own levels of mean diffusivity that diverge from cis people. Their levels of connection between neural networks are different from those of cis people. And trans and cis women have similar sized central subdivisions of the bed of the nucleus of the stria terminalis. Um, <laughs> who am I kidding? Uh, apparently that's the part of the brain that has a lot to do with sexual behavior. The point is, there's something going on here. If this really is the case for trans people, it would suggest that biological sex and gender identity are not completely separate. And given that the body and brain develop at different times and biological sex is already kind of messy, it isn't hard to imagine the idea of the body sometimes going one way and the brain going another. The real question is, how do we group people when their gender identity is misaligned with their body? If you're a sex essentialist, you would just say, follow the gonads, because that's the most literal definition of sex. But biologists don't seem to think it's that simple, and you can demonstrate that without even referring to trans people. Let me introduce you to congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Congenital meaning the condition is present at birth, and adrenal hyperplasia meaning their adrenal glands are slightly larger than usual. Now that doesn't sound like much, but within this group, there is such a thing as people who have XX chromosomes and ovaries, but also fully formed penises. So, what do we do here? Well, if you saw one of them newly born, you'd probably just assume they were male, but when these people ended up in hospitals, doctors would traditionally identify them as females because I guess they thought eggs come first? But this decision was later criticized as a dogmatic approach to gender assignment, and people have since argued to categorize them as males. And one of their reasons for making this argument was that the patients, despite their mixed biology, all identified as males. In other words, their gender identity overrode what we would typically understand as their biological sex. So when we're asking the question, is the innate gender identity of a trans woman enough to include her in the category of woman? I would say the answer is yes, and here's why. Suppose you woke up one day and your brain had been placed in someone else's body. You still have your memories, your conscious experience, your sense of self and all that, but every other part of your body is someone else's. Now, are you you or are you the other person? Bob, would you feel more comfortable if people addressed you by your name or by Bob's name? Now, okay, this is a rhetorical question, but the answer is you would still be you and fuck you, everyone agrees with me. And I know that because I remember the body swap scene from Scooby-Doo. Like, why am I wearing a dress? Everyone remain calm. Velma, what the heck's going on? If my calculations are correct, due to the fragile nature of unstable- And that is not even the best example. Do you know who else agrees with me on this? J.K. Rowling agrees with me. When Harry drank the polyjuice potion and found himself in Goyle's body, did he stop being Harry? Or better, when Hermione drank the polyjuice potion with a cat hair on it, did she become the cat? No. Every cell in her body was that of a cat. Well, maybe not her brain, I, I don't know how that works. Magic. But all the same, she was still Hermione because her identity, her sense of self, came first. She wasn't mentally ill. She wasn't delusional. She knew exactly what was going on with her body, and when she acknowledged that her mind was out of congruence with her body, she wasn't wrong. In fact, being in the cat's body was kind of distressing for her. She didn't want to come out of the cubicle. What she was experiencing was a kind of… dysphoria, perhaps? And if the polyjuice potion was irreversible, the treatment for that dysphoria would have been to bring her body back into line with who she identified as. For society to recognize her as Hermione the girl and not the cat, whatever its name was. Trans-positive JK Rowling arc? We, we can be hopeful.
Now, of course, no one is treating the idea of the sexed brain as settled science. The brain is complex. You're complex. I'm complex. Your mum is complex. In fact, there's so much variation that the idea of there being any kind of gender binary of the brain is completely out. I guess you could make one objection. We do know about a few differences in the brain between trans and cis people, but none of these actually tell us what it is in the brain that makes a person trans. To which I would argue that that burden of proof isn't really needed. We still don't even know what makes a person gay, but we have nonetheless managed to come this far by treating homosexuality as something that is innate and immutable. Or you might be thinking, hey Lonerbox, isn't this all just kind of like a transmedicalist argument? Um, no. Transmedicalism is the idea that you need gender dysphoria to be trans, and depending on who you ask, it also rejects non-binary identities, but I would argue that the concept of brain sex is actually a good argument against transmedicalism. If our knowledge of trans identity is still this limited, would it really be wise to gatekeep that behind one single diagnosis? Is it really impossible for someone to have that incongruence without having the intense psychological distress of gender dysphoria? I find that hard to believe, and it looks like medical professionals feel the same. As for non-binary identities, we've already shown how the concept of distinct male and female brains is kind of dated, as in wrong. If anything, the brain is probably the least binary aspect of your sex. We already know about ambiguous genitalia and ambiguous karyotypes, so why would there not be ambiguous brain sex as well? I mean, I personally do know what ambiguous brain sex feels like. Just ask your mom. Part 4. Conclusion When people talk about whether woman is a matter of biology, identity, or social construction, I always feel like they're framing it like there's some kind of triple threat match between the three of them. My own opinion is that it's kind of all of them. Take the example of Patricia Davies the World War II veteran who lived publicly as a man until the age of 90 before finally coming out in 2017. Like many trans people, Davies learned that she was trans incredibly early on in her life, at the age of three to be exact. Given that this was in the early 1930s, I doubt the progressive media can take the blame for that one. Whether or not you want to call it biological, her identity was innate to her and it wasn't going anywhere because the social understanding of trans women didn't even exist at the time, she chose to live her life as a man. After all, the alternative would have been electroshock therapy, being outcast as a homosexual, jailed, or whatever else. But in 1987, she came out privately to her wife, and in 2017, in a society with a very different understanding of Matt Walsh's little question, she was finally able to start hormone therapy and live as a woman. So when a good honest truth seeker comes up to you and says, what is a woman? There are a few answers you can give. You can say a woman is an adult human female. You can ask them to explain what exactly an adult human female is and watch as they try not to reduce women down to their breeding parts. You can talk about how a trans woman is a woman who is assigned male at birth, which is perfectly within the realms of science and the same dictionary that gave you the definition of woman. Or you can just invoke old Ludwig and define it the way we define all kinds of things. By examples. This is a woman. This is a woman. This is a woman. This is not a woman. Your mom is a woman. Bye. Tiesire. Tiesila. So it's a clum in favela testitave cum sepela quantus tres mortes furas quando iudex es venturas constas tristes tristes casoras Tiesire, tiesila, so vet seclum, in favela, teste david consipila, quod.
sanctus tremores futures, quando iudix est venturas, custas triste descursuras, quando tremores futures, ti esire, ti esila, quando tremores futuros, ti esire, ti esila. Quando tremores futuros, quando tremores futuros, quando iudex est venturas, conta stricte descosuras. Canta stricte, canta stricte, stricte descasuras. Canta stricte, canta stricte, stricte descasuras.